Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, February 19th. Welcome to Senate Education. Uh, sometimes I feel like saying I'm your host, uh, but this is um, Senate Education where we are gonna be returning to a couple of topics, but quick housekeeping, uh, two weeks to cross over. So that means we have uh, next week to vote out bills. Then we'll have our uh, crossover break. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll have another week. Um, we can, if there's something we don't get out, uh, we can always ask for a, a rules extent, an extension from the rules committee, um, work with the corner office, uh, Senator Ballance team. Uh, but uh, at this point, I'm anticipating that we should be okay, uh, but we'll see. So uh, we are going to start by returning to the topic, uh, the broad topic of church and state. Uh, Mr. Uh, Demaray has a, uh, a new draft for us, and we're gonna hear from Ledge Council and Bor Yang. Many of uh, you know Bor through her work uh, with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and then uh, senators asked, the very good question around funding. Uh, where are some of the funds going to be coming from uh, when people are talking to their constituents and others and just for broad knowledge? So I've asked Joint Fiscal to come in. Uh, Catherine Benham and, uh, and Steve Klein will talk to us a little bit about, you know, funds, dollar amounts, where, possible funding may come from, uh, you know, as we give our recommendations to appropriations. Uh, related to that, I did share with the pro tem and the chair of appropriations last evening, uh, a draft of our letter and just generally letting them know the direction that we are heading in. Um, one of the things uh, Ms. Benham and others have reminded me of is that there will be multiple trains leaving the station uh, going forward as it relates to uh, appropriations. We know that there are, just to repeat, as we've talked about, budget adjustment, and then this expedited bill, we have the big bill, and also the possibility of other funds. And I know that Ms. Benham and Mr. Klein will give us uh, additional information on that. Um, we will then talk a little bit about Vermont's education professional standards. Uh, senators may recall one of the things we've been interested in is streamlining uh, standards for teachers uh, with the help, with the hope that we might increase our, our pool of applicants, et cetera. Uh, one of the tools possibly in our toolkit. And then we'll wrap up the day with uh, Secretary French. Uh, appreciate him coming in to talk with us again about our letter there are still a few holes um, and uh, see if we can uh, if we can help address some of those uh, qu outstanding questions that we have. So with that, uh, not seeing any hands up, uh, I think we will go to uh, Mr. Demaray. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, I'm uh, Jim Demaray, Let's Consul. We are talking today about uh, the ability um, of a school district to use public funds to pay tuition to a um, school, independent school with a religious mission. Um, and before I go into the bill language, which I will um, share on the screen shortly, I just wanted to frame the issue for a moment. And the issue we have um, is not an issue that concerns our constitution or our statutes. The issue we have concerns practice on the ground, what school districts are doing today um, and how they're approaching this question. Uh, the US Constitution uh, requires that um, a generally available, available benefit uh, like tuition that goes to independent schools um, cannot be denied to a school based on its religious status. Um, the Vermont Constitution holds the same. You can't discriminate based on religious status. But the Vermont Constitution requires that before you uh, district pays public funds to a school with a religious mission, before that happens, there have to be safeguards to ensure that money is not being used 
for uh, worship or religious instruction or uh, propagation of religion. So the U.S. Constitution and the Vermont Constitution are consistent on this question. Uh, our statutes on tuition are consistent with our Constitution. And the problem that we're having, um, the school districts have been denying uh, payment to uh, these schools that have a religious mission based on their staffs. So when asked by the school uh, or the parents of a student, can you pay tuition to Rice Memorial High School? Uh, districts have been saying, no, because you're really the school, no. And that's the problem. Um, so we need, uh, what this bill proposes to do is to give districts direction as to how to respond to that question correctly. Um, and the correct response is to require, <coughs> according to Professor Tishout, who you heard from last week, is to require school districts to receive a certification from those schools, not just those schools, from all approved independent schools that says that the funds will not be used for the purpose of religious instruction, worship, or propagation. So by doing that, you have a uniform approach throughout the hundred and so school districts that we have in the state, uh, and it clarifies the position. Uh, a number of court cases are happening right now because of this issue. Um, and this bill is designed to make a statement by the legislature as to what the right direction is to avoid these problems going forward. Is that clear? Any questions about that before I proceed? Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Chittenden, please. Thank you, Jim. That was very helpful. I received a call from a good friend of mine that was concerned about our discussions on this topic. And the core of their concern, I think you just addressed, is that this could be used to prevent what monies are currently allowed and going to some schools with religious missions. But your, your understanding of what we're doing here is to clean up the language and, if anything, allowing school districts to enable the, the sending of public monies to schools with religious missions, as, assuming they certify. So by no means could this bill be interpreted based on what we understand so far as prohibiting or preventing current monies per, uh, that are going to some schools with some public monies going to schools with religious missions that is not going to be affected by by the intent of this bill. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I would say yes. Um, I would qualify that by saying that my understanding today is that money is not going to these uh, schools to religious mission because of confusion at school district level as to what the rules are. Now, whether or not the schools can certify uh, that they won't use it for this purpose is a separate question, right? So assuming they can certify this, then they would be available for the, the, these funds. Okay. Um, Senator Chittenden, that feels, that's good. Okay, great. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Hooker. Yes, um, Jim, could you just talk about the, the lawsuits and um, their being brought on the basis of being denied the, the tuition? Sure. So you have, you have lawsuits happening in the courts. You also have appeals going to the State Board of Education because in some cases, school districts have the authority to allow um, operating districts have the authority to send their children to uh, another school. So you have two things going on, court cases and State Board of Education cases going on. Um, and, and the theme of these cases is, is that the courts are basing their, their decisions on the record before them. Okay, and the record before them is, uh, in some cases, uh, statements made by school districts to parents that they are unable to use tuition funds uh, because of the status of the school. So the courts look at that and they say it's based upon discrimination based on status, and that's unconstitutional. Okay, um, also what's happening is on dual, dual enrollment, which this bill now addresses too, but I don't propose to go through that today necessarily unless we have time. But dual enrollment, same thing's happening. Districts are saying you can't have dual enrollment to a student who goes to Rice Memorial High School because you're a religious school. Okay. 
that's not the correct statement to make because actually uh, if the school was on public tuition, they could do dual enrollment. And the only reason they're not on public tuition is the schools are denying them based on the rate of the staff. So it all comes back to the same question. Okay. Is that helpful, Senator? It is, it is. And I know that we've talked about this before, but the idea that uh, money sent to a school for dual enrollment, even though it's going to a, perhaps a college that is not re certainly not religiously oriented, but that that could kind of um, be used in place of money that's being spent for courses provided at the school. So that was, you know, just a, yeah. I guess, it, so right now the money can go, but schools are saying it can't because- School districts are, are denying, yeah. Because of the status of the school. Yeah, correct, correct, yep. And, and we have, uh, Mr. Demery, please correct me if I'm wrong. We have, I mean, if we were to do nothing, which is always an option, we would have school districts, uh, we would wait for lawsuits to be settled uh, and uh, yeah. see how things play out. I mean, it's, but the constitution itself in the, in, in not, and both courts have said that these kinds of things have to happen. We just need to put the guidelines around them. Yeah, that, that is correct. And um, the, um, if you did nothing, then um, today, recently in the last month, the Agency of Education gave guidance to school districts on this topic, but that guidance is non-binding. Mm -hmm. um, the AOE doesn't feel it's in a position to instruct on this. It's really a school district decision. So um, there is something out there that could be helpful, um, but not coming from you and what's out there now is non-binding. Um, and what's happening too right now is, uh, at least in one of the cases, you have a, um, a federal appeals court saying um, that you have to uh, allow for uh, tuition, basically, um, because you have discrimination based on status. But there are no safeguards to protect that money against religious use, use uses for religious instruction. So you have a federal court saying he has, he has to comply with the U.S. Constitution, which could violate the, the Vermont Constitution because without the safeguards, you can't do that. So you have basically some districts running the crosshair right now of, of two competing, competing things. And without the guidance here, um, maybe they'll, they'll find their way through, but this is designed to give them clear guidance as to how to get through that. Let's just take a quick trip back to the 1700s, Jim, and we'll let you lead this trip. Any idea, any thoughts on, you know, in, in your study of the law and the constitution, what the founders were thinking about this kind of thing? <laughs> uh, I can't answer that question. There's been so much uh, development of these principles over the last 200 years. Yeah. And 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there point that Senator Hooker was making about diversion of funds would have been a very relevant conversation. Today, the court doesn't worry about diversion of funds in this context. So things have changed a lot. Sure. We've, got, we've got cases that have just come up in the last year, big cases, Espinoza, one that Damien will talk about, that are just changing the whole landscape that we're working in. Okay. Senator Chinden. This is really helpful, Jim. So can it be said that this bill is to designed to prevent school districts from discriminating against schools because of their religious mission? Yes. I love that, thank you. Yeah, yes, yeah. And so before I go to the bill, there's one more framing issue, which is um, you've talked before about having the certification requirement. It's been in the bill language. What's new about this bill language is it also now requires approved independent schools regardless of their religious staff. So approved independent schools, Burr Burton, uh, Rice Memorial High School, regardless of the, their mission, would have to comply with the same anti-discrimination laws that apply to public schools. 
in order to get the grant funds, uh, the, the, the public tuition. Um, that's new in this bill, and that's why you have the witnesses you have today to talk about that aspect of it. Um, I've also added into this bill language about dual enrollment, but I won't cover that at the outset because I think you want to hear more about the discrimination issues, and we can cover that when we have time, time maybe there or next week, if that's okay. Sure. So with that, Gene, if I could share my screen, um, I'll pull up this document. Okay. Right here. Okay, yeah. Okay. Can people see this document? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, so the bill now proposes to do three things. One, to ensure compliance of the U.S. and Vermont constitutions by clarifying that a school district is authorized to pay public tuition to a qualified school or program. Those words are kind of um, defined terms of statute, but what we're talking about here are independent schools. Uh, for this, this conversation, okay. Um, regardless of its religious status or affiliation, if the school or program has adequate safeguards to ensure that none of the tuition for which payment is requested has been or will be used to support re religious instruction or worship or the propagation of religious views. Second, to prohibit a school district from paying public tuition to a qualified school program, again, regardless of status, Unless the school or program complies with all federal and state anti-discrimination laws applicable to public schools. And third, clarify under what circumstances a school district shall make dual enrollment available to students who attend a school with a religious mission. Okay, so um, we've gone through this before, um, but let's go through it quickly again. Um, we have some findings. Uh, so. First finding is that the Vermont Constitution has a compelled support clause, which provides that no person can be compelled to support any place of worship contrary to the dictates of conscience. That applies to taxpayers. So taxpayers can't be compelled through their tax payments to support any place of worship. In this case of Chittenden Town versus Department of Education from 1999, the Vermont Supreme Court held that a school district may pay public tuition to a school with a religious mission under the, the Compelled Support Clause if the school has adequate safeguards against the use of such funds for religious worship or instruction or the propagation of religious views. And the purpose of Section 2 below is to define adequate safeguards that a school district must employ to ensure that public okay. I found this on the web for Define Aqua Safeguard. Sorry, my iPhone's going off. Um, sorry. The purpose of Section 2 is to ensure uh, that um, safeguards are put in place uh, by school districts. Okay. Section 2 is amending existing statute. It's uh, Section 828, and that's the section that deals with tuition paid to approved schools. And uh, unchanged, section, sub, subsection A says, a school district shall not pay the tuition of a student except to a public school, an approved independent school, which is what we're focusing on, and then also to an approved in school meeting, education quality standards, a tutorial program, approved education program, uh, or an independent school in another state. So all that's being covered here. Uh, under our language, but we're really focused on this approved independent school part. So you can pay to improve the independent school. Now, B is new language. It says a school district shall not pay tuition under subsection A of this section to any of the school programs identified in that subsection, regardless of, of, of religious status or affiliation, unless it receives certification from that school or program under subsection D of this section, uh, which I'll come to. Provide that public schools that receive tuition from a school district are exempt. Um, 
And then there's language here that is designed to say, uh, and we can focus on this language maybe a, a future day, but it's designed to say that schools are permitted to give basically overview courses in religion. So this is not to say you can't teach religion at all. Um, and that's what this language here is, is, is trying to express. The main topic for today, though, is here, which is, is that to see a school district shall not pay tuition under subsection A of this section to any of the school, schools or programs identified in that subsection um, unless the school or program complies with all federal and state anti-discrimination laws applicable to school, public schools. And then lastly, in D, it says in order for a school or program identified in that subsection to receive public tuition from a school district, it shall certify to the school district that none of the tuition for which payment is requested has been or will be used to support religious instruction or worship or the propagation of religious views and that the school or program complies with all federal and state anti-discrimination laws applicable to public schools. This certification requirement shall not apply to public schools. So I'm gonna stop sharing for, for a moment. And I just wanna say that the topic for the witnesses coming next, I believe, is around the extent to which it's permissible to uh, require these independent schools to um, comply with all anti-discrimination laws. What I will say is this provision is not outright saying they have to comply. It's a condition to receive public tuition. So it's not an unconditional requirement, it's a condition to receive public funding. And that's the framework that I think we're talking about this in. So that was going to be it for my part of this, but I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, so if I may, so if if I had a child who was going to go to uh, the St. Andrew's Episcopal School down the road or something, under this, if this were to pass as is, that St. Andrew's would have to comply with uh, anti-discrimination policies put forward by the state and federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Jr. could enroll in introduction to religious studies down there, but does that mean Brian Jr. cannot or they would not allow him to take a class specific on uh, teaching the New Testament or, or something like that? Yeah, this, this is not designed to interfere with school's, school's mission. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so it comes to it comes to that your question goes to the point of how does the independent school make the certification? Yeah. Okay. And the certification itself is one that that as drafted has to be trusted because there's nothing more to it than providing a certification. Yeah. Um, ways in which schools may approach that, I don't know. But for example, uh, schools have capital funds for obviously improving their buildings and facilities and operations. They have food budgets. They have things that are non that don't go to religious mission that schools just do. So they could segregate funds for that purpose using this public tuition money for those purposes. They could say, look, sixty percent of our day is basically a secular thing. 40% is not, so we're going to accept 60% of the, of the tuition, of a tuition and not 40%. There are different ways they could do it, and this doesn't tell them how to do it because you heard from Professor Teachout last week, it gets very messy when you try to go in there and figure that out. So it goes, it's a question for the schools to decide how to comply with this certification requirement. Other questions? before we move on to, uh, yes, uh, please, Senator Lyons. So um, th this is such a complex area, but is there jurisprudence on, uh, uh, I mean, obviously we have the, the Chittenden decision, but then there's significant, there are significantly more court cases relating to this. And I, I think of things like 
the prayer before the start of school or uh, before a sports uh, event uh, and those things. Um, so, you know, suppose a, a child from a secular school can only play a sport if he or she is at the at rice and the the rule of thumb is that there's always a prayer or a blessing before the game begins. Could a, could that be considered a, a violation if um, some of the money is being used for um, the sports team? That's a good question. I'm not an expert, frankly, in this area. <laughs> so okay. I have some I mean, trouble I, going. I, I, it's probably not an answerable question, but it, uh, you know, I think it's, it's probably the responsibility of schools to uh, when they certify that all of their staff are well informed uh, about the meaning. <laughs> you know, right. so, yeah. They have to have some system in place, I think, to, yeah. to spend these funds in a way that does not um, contradict the certification. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I mean, because I can, I, uh, you know, despite how young I am, I do remember when Under God was put into the Pledge of Allegiance and the and the big fuss that was made about that by some of the agnostic people in the country. So, sure. yeah. It's hard to believe <laughs> <clears throat> that you. Would yes, it is, Senator. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Senator Chittenden, please. I don't know how much, Jerry, you want to spend on this, how much time you want to spend on this, but to Senator Lyons's point, just I think this is important for us as a committee to understand what we're talking about if this goes to the floor so we can defend it. Um, in that example, I would understand as long as the prayer isn't anti-discriminatory, and even if by some chance somebody did say something inflammatory or discriminatory, sorry, not anti, but discriminatory, as long as the school didn't condone it and the school didn't like require that same prayer every game and they instead, in fact, addressed it, then it would be resolvable. And so simultaneously, as long as they didn't require every student to, to conform to a prayer or to, to share the prayer, then it, it would still probably meet that certification process. Is that a, a fair way to, to stretch out her, her example? Well, I would just say, I mean, the whole topic of prayer um, or or places or various um, uh, things like that, that that deal with, um, with religion in schools is a very broad topic, right? We're talking today about a more narrow topic about use of public funds uh, going to these types of schools and what they would need to do to comply. And again, uh, there are lots of things you can go into probably as to these questions, but, but the bill doesn't do that. <laughs> the bill is simply looking for cert certification um, and leaving those questions really over there, if you will. Um, Senator Hooker, did you have your, uh, you're all set, okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jim. And I think we'll now move on uh, to Mr. Leonard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Going okay. It's right. Friday, right? Thanks for being <laughs> with us. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Mr. Leonard, if you would remind us, uh, just take us to uh, the section again that you are um have some expertise in and give us your thoughts that would be most appreciated sure so um what i've been working with jim on on this is the requirement that the schools comply with uh the anti-discrimination federal and state anti-discrimination laws mm -hmm. um and what makes that sort of a, a uniquely complicated issue in this case is a series of cases um, that culminated most recently uh, with the 2019-2020 Supreme Court uh, session in a case uh, called uh, Morrissey-Beru versus um, 
Our Lady of Guadalupe School. I, I reversed them in the title, but the uh, what that case was, was it was a case, um, it was two cases that were consolidated at the Supreme Court where uh, Catholic elementary school fifth grade teachers uh, had sued their schools uh, in one case for age discrimination and in the other case for disability discrimination when their contracts weren't renewed. Um, the uh, So what, what was at issue in that case was whether what's called the ministerial exception uh, applied to those individuals. And what the ministerial exception is, is it's the idea that a religious institution, including a religious school, should be able to choose and, if necessary, remove uh, a minister without government interference. Um, in other words, the, the state uh, or the government shouldn't be permitted to force a religious institution to keep a, a, a minister or a preacher or a rabbi who is teaching something contradictory to the dictates of the faith. Um, and the state shouldn't be interfering in their decision about whether to continue employing someone in a min ministerial role. Um, this, uh, this doctrine or this exception has gradually expanded over time. Um, the sort of first landmark case in this was about someone whose title actually included the word minister. So they were actually named as a minister. In this case, neither of the teacher's titles uh, indicated that they were a minister. They were both just fifth grade teachers. Um, neither of them had had formal religious training. Um, and neither of them was held in an especially elevated role within the hierarchy of the, the religious institution. They were both just regular teachers. Um, so from that standpoint, um, the, the plaintiffs in that case argued that they shouldn't be subject uh, to that ministerial exception. Uh, but what the court um, basically focused on is, do they play a religious leadership role? Um, and so they're, they're looking at what do they do? And uh, very importantly, Justice Alito, um, who wrote the, the majority opinion that in that case, focused on this sort of functional test. Um, and he uh, identified various things that they did during the day. Um, including leading the students in prayer, taking them to mass, um, helping them prepare for uh, various religious events at the school. Um, and then in some cases, teaching the school's religion class, um, all as being ministerial roles. Uh, and thus, even though those individuals didn't um, didn't have the formal title of minister. Uh, they weren't Catholic priests or um, nuns or anything like that. Uh, they were just regular teachers and their contracts didn't even require them to be Catholic. Um, he, he basically ruled that their role as teachers within that institution made them key to sort of the, the, the religious purpose of the school uh, and therefore found that because they, they had that role and because they performed some of these religious activities, uh, they were subject to this ministerial exception, which meant, uh, and this is the key point here, um, that the court could not consider the anti or the discrimination claims that they'd filed. Um, so in other words, the schools were exempt from federal discrimination laws under, in this case, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, but they've also applied this to the, um, the other civil rights anti-employment discrimination uh, provisions. Um, and so essentially what you've got here uh, with this bill is you're requiring compliance with state and federal discrimination law. 
Um, and I'm, I'm not aware of an instance where this has been applied in a, to a state law, but under the supremacy clause of the constitution, um, I would argue that the US constitution um, would, would win out if you had a state law that was unconstitutional. And so we cannot necessarily enforce an anti-discrimination law with respect to uh, teachers at a religious institution. You might be able to with respect to someone uh, like a custodian or uh, someone who prepares and serves meals, um, someone who performs a purely administrative role, um, you might be able to apply the anti-discrimination laws to them. Um, but the, the, the courts would, at, at least in my reading here, I think it's likely that the courts would, uh, if you had a teacher or other person in some sort of educational role, um, filing a discrimination claim, that they could potentially have their, their case dismissed under this ministerial exception. So it, it is a, a sort of complicated place where our protection of discrimination meets the First Amendment protections against the state interfering in the establishment of religion. Um, and I know you have Bor Yang with you today, um, and she may have some other thoughts on this, um, but this to me kind of presents a little bit of a conundrum with this bill. Um, because I'm, I'm you're, you're asking for a self-certification, but are you also compelling them to do something that they're not required to do under the constitution? Or are you simply saying, uh, as provided by you know, the existing case law, you have to comply with uh, the anti-discrimination provisions? So, um, and it, another thing that's just worth pointing out is uh, there is no uh, rigid test that the courts apply on this. Uh, it's sort of a four-factor test where they weigh the different factors I, I mentioned, the title, the training, uh, the role within the religious institution, and then their actual functional role. Um, and so you could find on different facts with a different school, that Episcopalian school down the road from you, Mr. Chair, um, that in that case, the individual wasn't fulfilling a religious role and the anti-discrimination laws do apply. So this, this could be very fact specific depending on an individual's role and, and what purposes they fulfill during their day. I see there's a question from Senator Lyons already. Yes, so. good, uh, please Senator Lyons. Not, ju not just one, a thousand. This is your <laughs> uh, I do have two questions. Um, I'll ask the broader question. If, if the state of Vermont had a, an integrated um, equal rights amendment that protected people regardless of disability, if we throw, put disability in, or ethnic and racial um, backgrounds, if we had that, would that uh, provide for the discrimination protection that we're seeking in this bill, anti-discrimination protection? Um, again, I, I think what you're running into here is you're going to, to deal with an issue where uh, the court or the, the judicial body um, that considers this is going to have to balance the institution's First Amendment rights um, versus the uh, right to be free from discrimination of the individual. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure that I can give you a clear answer one way or the other, but I think any court that considers this is going to be considering the sort of competing constitutional and legal um, factors here. Um, another thing to just note is that a state constitution um, if you have a state constitution that directly contradicts a right that's provided under the federal constitution, I think there's a very strong argument that the federal right wins out 
Um, so you can't deprive someone of their rights under the US Constitution um, through state action. But um, it, it would it would definitely be an interesting case. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, so the other, but my other question, I think you've answered um, that by, by giving a certification that they are not violating the, uh, they aren't using the money for religious purposes. Is the, is, would it be considered that the school is effectively waiving its rights? So if you're certifying that you're not using it, that means that you're adhering to what the law is requiring. And therefore you would be saying, um, I waive my rights in this instance, as long as I'm adhering to the requirements of the statute. Um, I'm not sure that I would read an implied waiver um, into the certification that you're not using the money for religious purposes. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of background in um, education law, for example, but in the area where I am more familiar in labor law, um, before it was struck down at the U.S. Supreme Court, um, for many years, when agency fees were legal in the country, uh, there was a test that was set out where you had to be able to show that you weren't using the money collected. So an agency fee is a compelled fee paid to the union by non-members for the representative services. And you had to show that the union wasn't using it for speech activities because that would have violated the individual's right to free speech. So for example, if I was in the bargaining unit, but I was anti-union, I just happened to be represented by one. I didn't have to pay for their political action, but I did have to pay for their services. Now that's been struck down, so it's aside. But I think when you're doing that certification, um, and I wasn't here for your other testimony, what you may see is, you know, so our religious instruction is funded by the diocese of um, the local diocese and our math and science and English curriculum and our foreign languages curriculum that's funded by tuition. Um, so that that could be a way that you could meet at, at least from my standpoint, not knowing the education law very well, that could be a way that you could meet that standard. Um, potentially. Senator, uh, Senator Lyons, uh, are you comfortable? With yeah, your... um, no, I'm not, I'm not comfortable, right. but right. I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Hooker. Oh, just a question about the draft that we're on, because I don't seem to have the one that's up on the screen. I don't know if there, was there another draft that was sent, Jim? Yeah, I should be, is it not posted? Um, Got, it does, it just actually, doesn't have the yellow on it. I think it's the same thing though. No, I don't see the, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm not looking. Draft 3.1. Hmm. It's, it's draft 3.2. Yeah, this, I have 3.1 on yeah. on our on our site. And I, I did want to ask. Uh, uh, just a second. Uh, Jeannie, would you mind putting 3.2 up? I'm looking, see if I have it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hooker. Yeah, um, Damien, you were talking about the four things that, you know, um, would put a person under like ministerial exception. Mm -hmm. uh, are they, you know, all four of them, two of the four, whatever. And then you talked about teachers who weren't even um, religious, you know, had no religious affiliation. So say a math teacher who doesn't do the prayer, doesn't take the kids to mass, doesn't do any of that. Is that person, would that person be protected under the anti-discrimination? Uh, so in that case, I think that there is an argument, uh, a strong argument that they are, um, but it hasn't, to my knowledge, been addressed in the courts yet. Um, Bohr may be able to give you more insight onto this. Um, she certainly has a greater um, amount of expertise in anti-discrimination law than I do. But um, in, in this case, uh, 
I think it, it was important to this case that the, the teachers here prayed with their students, attended mass with them, and prepared them for participation in other religious activities at the school. Um, so in this case, they did have some religious function and one of the teachers uh, taught the um, religion class that was required for her fifth graders uh, from the textbook, although she, um, you know, she argued in court that uh, she was just basically providing them the exercises in the textbook. She wasn't actually providing them the kind of instruction that, um, you know, like a youth minister or a, a priest or, or rabbi might provide. Um, but the court rejected that argument and said, no, you're performing religious activities that are at the core of the school's religious mission. Um, so therefore you're covered. The, the dissenting justices in the case, um, Justices Sotomayor and the late Justice Ginsburg, um, in their dissent, um, they kind of raised the question, well, where is the line? Uh, is a coach who leads the, the football or the track team in a prayer before the competition, are they a minister? Um, and you know, what about, and they, they laid out a series of sort of what ifs, where does the, where does this religious function end, or are we just going to, is it, is it up to the institution to say, um, say where, where that function ends? Because, um, and so I think that's an open question at this point, um, but I think that there's a strong argument if you have a teacher who teaches nothing but, you know, the calculus and algebra curriculum, um, and that's all they do, then potentially they are not covered by this ministerial exception um, in the same way that a custodial staff member who provides no religious instruction, um, but just happens to work in a building owned by a religious institution, uh, has a strong argument that they are not covered by the ministerial exception because they're not performing a ministerial role. Thank you. Uh, it, Mr. Leonard, say something, would you, about students in religious institutions? In other words, uh, gay students uh, that may want to, um, you know, attend a dance together, uh, students who might be transitioning, um, Say something, if you would, about, because again, what we would like, to, what we're trying to do with this is to protect those students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I would defer to um, Bohr there, okay. um, because it's, it's outside of employment law, and my, my very limited experience comes from attending a Catholic university. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't know the, the law here. Um, so uh, I would defer to her. Uh, Mr. Demaray, you had your hand up. Yeah, if I could just um, say that it's not the case in this bill language that we would be proposing to apply the anti-discrimination laws directly to these schools. It's not like we're coming in here saying, Independent schools, you have to comply right. with all, and it is only, um, they will only be applied um, as a condition of taking public money. So it's like, I just want to frame it that way because I'm hearing everything, everything that Damien is saying, um, but I'm wondering if that all stands true if the requirement is a condition of a privilege. Uh, it's a condition of getting public funds as opposed to a strict requirement just to comply. And the same thing that we do on the public accommodation side, uh, same question, it's really around conditioning public monies on this requirement, not an outright requirement just to comply. Yeah, and that, that's outside of my area of expertise. I might defer to David Hall on, on that one. I mean, it, it's worth noting the, 
our anti-discrimination laws, at least ostensibly, with a couple of minor exceptions, or not minor, but a couple of limited exceptions, I, that was the wrong choice of words there, but a couple of limited exceptions um, do apply to all employers in the state. The, the key piece here is that the, the federal courts, the U.S. Supreme Court has um, established this ministerial exception um, under the First Amendment. And so that's kind of the, the interesting area there for a religious institution. And there, there have been a number of cases um, which I, I just can't pretend to, to know all the ins and outs of regarding when a religious institution has to provide certain types of health protections, et cetera. Um, and th this is probably an area where Bohr can give you a little bit better sense of some of the ins and outs. And David may be able to talk about um, you know, whether you can condition the receipt of public funds on something like this. I mean, at, at least on the surface, the school needs to abide by the anti-discrimination laws. The catch is they don't need to do it for someone who is a minister. Right. Um, so right now, as is, if you have stand at the Episcopal school, and you're a student, that school has to abide by the state's anti-discrimination policies, which protect members of the LGBTQ community. But as it relates to the ministerial role, it, it, it isn't protecting a faculty member. Yeah, although- so that's The first part by itself, is it protecting the students? I, again, I can't answer the question on the students. Um, I can't answer for employees. I see, okay. Um, and just with respect to state law, we do have an express exemption in our state law um, that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity shall not be construed to prohibit or prevent an organization operated for charitable or educational purposes, and that is operated, supervised, or controlled by or in connection with a religious organization from giving preference to persons of the same religion or denomination, or from taking any action with respect to employment matters that is calculated by the organization to promote the religious principles for which it is established or maintained. Uh, so in other words, there, uh, there is a limitation on our, our protections against employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity already in statute with respect to religious organizations. Um, if the decision not to, for example, hire someone um, of a certain sexual orientation or gender identity uh, is calculated to promote the religious pr principles of the organization. Um, so that's another thing worth noting here before we even get to that. And again, uh, with respect to the students, I really need to defer to board. Right, I'm going to stop uh, there, but I'd like you to stay on, Mr. Leonard. Uh, Ms. Yang, would you mind joining us? It sounds like you might have some be able to direct us. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. Uh, you have uh, hopefully heard some of this conversation. Uh, you know a little bit about what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have some answers from Mr. Leonard, but he's mentioned your name a few times as possibly being able to help us navigate this. So any assistance you can give would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, just for the record, Board Gang, the Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And I have been able to listen, and I think both him and Damien have done an excellent, excellent job. And I think the reality here is that this is a really tough area with competing interests and competing rights. And um, as Damien has mentioned, the US Constitution trumps every time. And a lot of these cases are interpreting the US Constitution. Um, and so when there are competing rights, that if, if you have the US Constitution on your side, most of the time you're going to you're just, you're gonna prevail. Um, 
I do want to mention that both the Vermont Fair Employment Practices Act and the Vermont Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Laws, which is our anti-discrimination laws in housing and places of public accommodations, all set forth exemptions around sexual orientation and gender identity. So places of public accommodations include schools, any school. We haven't said that that's only schools that receive public funds or, um, or non-religious schools. It's any school, really but that we have set forth an exemption for religious institutions to discriminate as it relates to um, same-sex marriage or um, uh, same-sex relationships. And I'm trying to look for the exact language so I can read it to you here in a second, but uh, the, the reality is we haven't had a lot of cases that in interpret that. It is possible that a school that receives money could use that exemption to discriminate against kids who are LGBTQ. That is, that is the, the reality when you, set, when you have an exemption such as that. Um, so I, I wanted to point out some important cases. Some, some of this is redundant because Damon mentioned it too, but the US Supreme Court case of Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church was the uh, involved a teacher who filed a disability discrimination claim and uh, was retaliated against. And that was the case where the US Supreme Court said, well, if you are a minister and you have that title, then we have no authority to judge and to decide whether this um, particular institution has engaged in discrimination. They're basically saying we wash our hands, we have no right to, to make a decision here. And what follows is the case that Damien mentioned, Our Lady of Guadalupe School, where the court then completely broadens the definition of who is a minister. So it's someone who doesn't even have to be Catholic, maybe doesn't even receive the religious training, who certainly don't have the the title as ministers, but play some important religious role are now captured within that exception. Um, and so I would love to think that maybe a custodian or a math teacher would not fall within that exception, but I don't feel really confident that that would necessarily be the case when they work at a religious institution. So, uh, so we're not sure. Um, another case that I think it's important to highlight is the St. John's Berry Academy case versus DH. So, um, oh, before I do that, I want to just mention that the teachers in these cases were discriminated against on the basis of disability. One teacher had uh, was aging, so it was an age discrimination case, and in another case, the teacher had um, breast cancer and then was terminated. So I'm not aware of any religious tenants that would permit that kind of discrimination, but nevertheless, we're not talking about sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination here. We're talking about religious institutions uh, really discriminating against teachers based on disability or age or otherwise. Okay, so the St. John's Bay Academy case is an important uh, Second Circuit Court case. It involves a student who um, has um, cerebral palsy and other disabilities. And uh, St. John's Berry Academy was the really the school that uh, they had chosen to go to. And this uh, particular student was on an IEP plan, which is covered under the IDEA laws that said that they had to be integrated into mainstream classrooms. But St. John's Berry Academy had a rule that says, you can only join the mainstream classrooms if you're functioning at like the fifth grade level. And uh, this particular student, because of their disabilities and their IE plan, was not could not meet that requirement. And then they were so they were excluded from the mainstream classroom. And that case went all the way to the Second Circuit. And what the academy argued in that case was that the law doesn't apply to them. The IDEA doesn't apply to independent schools. And they won. 
So the second circuit court decision was that the IDEA laws do not apply to independent schools. And it entirely ignored the fact that private institutions like St. Johnsbury probably get the majority of their funds from public funds. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of independent schools in Vermont that are primarily funded through federal through uh, public dollars, and so um, it, as I mean, one could argue, and I think that the um, the uh, student did argue that it essentially was operating like a public school, but nevertheless, the Second Circuit Court read that it wasn't. That student also raised um, by violations of the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And again, there the Second Circuit Court said that, that schools have the right to set certain qualifications. This kid didn't meet the qualifications. And so they weren't going to review the uh, 504 claims either. And so the student lost. Um, and I, I, I think that's important because the question ultimately is, what does certification mean? What, what value is it? Is it just a pro forma promise? Um, if there's no jurisdiction to review a school for firing their teachers, or there's no jurisdiction to review a school for uh, not permitting certain activities or not admitting certain students, if there's no jurisdiction over that, are they essentially in compliance? and therefore they can certify that they are in compliance or are they not in compliance? And um, I, th I think that that is sort of a really difficult uh, position. I certainly would support uh, this language because I think it's important that um, all of our kids have real choice regardless of their disabilities, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, to be able to choose which schools they go to if they live in a place where there is that choice. Um, but I don't feel particularly hopeful because of the case law. I do, the secondary question I have is more practical, uh, which is who really enforces the certification? I think Jim mentioned that about a promise from the schools that they're complying with the anti-discrimination laws, but what does it mean when they make that promise, but they actually aren't in compliance? How do we determine who is in compliance and who's not? What happens when they've already received public dollars and then they come, they're not in compliance? Um, and what are we looking to in terms of determining compliance? I'll just give you one example. Um, HUD requires that entities that received federal dollars for housing do not violate any anti-discrimination laws. And so they do require a similar kind of certification from those entities, but they also reach out to agencies like the Human Rights Commission to see if we've made a determination that those entities have violated the anti-discrimination laws in deciding whether or not to um, renew those grants and those funding uh, for the next session. Um, so I, I'm afraid I've thrown out more questions out there, but this more than probably answered them. But the, the reality of the fact is that the, the case law is not particularly helpful for all kids in Vermont. And um, I'm not sure I know how to reconcile that. Well, our only question to you is, what should we do? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it sounds like you would suggest that um, we move along. I, I think your point's a good one. How do you certify these? You know, how, so you put out these certifications, who's gonna check on them? What, what sort of, you know, it is as, but as Mr. Demaray has said all along, this is a bit of the honest policy, you know, uh, you know, make sure we're, we're committed to doing the right thing here. Uh, we're gonna certify and students are gonna come here and, and not receive, um, you know, religious instruction uh, with, with uh, tax dollars. But to your good point, I mean, the practical piece of that is how do you follow up on that? How do you check on it? I, I mean, if we were to put the anti-discrimination language in, uh, you know, it sounds also like um, 
you know, this ends up in a court, a court's going to immediately decide uh, against us. I don't think it's I don't think it's going to be clear one way or the other. I, okay. I certainly think I would move forward okay. if I were you. That's yep. just me, because I do think that the purpose and intent of this language is to be inclusive and protective. Mm -hmm. And I always say, let's go bold, Vermont, and the courts can determine this and interpret it later. And courts are always changing, too, by the way. Okay. Right. If we had a different kind of makeup on the U.S. Supreme Court, the decisions might have gone differently. Nevertheless, this is where we're at. And so uh, my feeling is uh, you put this sort of certification requirement out there. There's a good chance that schools will voluntarily just comply with the anti-discrimination laws. And so even if there was no enforcement piece to it, yeah, I still think it's a good thing. I would suggest that you add some type of enforcement. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking about what happened. Do they pay back those public funds if right. they, you, they're later discovered to have discriminated? Um, what happens to all the kids in the interim if there is a determination that a, a, a school um, has violated the anti-discrimination laws? Uh, again, here, the, the ministerial exception still potentially leaves a lot of employees who could be covered. Right. Uh, whether I feel hopeful about that or not, doesn't matter. I mean, there's still the legal argument that it could cover several employees. I also think that um, we're, we're talking a lot about religious institutions, but we have a lot of non-religious independent schools here too, who would fall under this. And th there's value in that, absolutely. Question. Senator Lyons, please. Actually, uh, Bohr, thank you. You answered most of my questions uh, regarding certification and whether we should include anything more in the bill. And it sounds like you, you're, from your perspective that we, if we remain silent on anti-discrimination that it's implied in the bill that folks are following uh, in the, in the uh, heading or in the findings that folks might be following anti-discrimination procedures in their schools. And so um, I, I think I agree with you <laughs> on this one. I think it's really important that we go forward. But my question, I do have a question. And the question I asked earlier uh, from, your, from your knowledge and work, if there is, um, if there is a certification, doesn't the certification mean that the school is willing to adhere to all the requirements of federal and of state law? So I'm going to leave federal out for now because we've got the Supreme Court hanging over us. But is can we say something about the fact that the certification does mean that? they will adhere to the same requirements that publicly funded institutions are adhering to or some similar type language. I think that the way I'm reading the current draft is that that is what you mean by it. Uh, I think the question for me, not really me, because I would interpret it that way. I think the question for some schools, particularly religious schools is, does that mean because there's no jurisdiction to determine whether, they, whether or not they are in compliance, does that mean that they essentially are? If you, if you have no court that can decide whether you're in compliance or not because you have a First Amendment right, are you actually then in compliance or does that mean you're not? And I think that is the odd piece here. Uh, but again, there's a lot of independent schools in Vermont that get public funds and that are not religious, and they would I, it, they would fall under that, except where it comes down to the uh, special education cases. Again, because we have that Second Circuit court case that has decided that uh, the IDEA laws do not apply to independent schools. 
in that way, that it's still the public entity's job to make sure that kids who are in, are, are in special education are still receiving all of those services that they're required to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's a hard question because what does it mean to be in compliance with the anti-discrimination laws? And then what, is it, what, what does it mean in terms of the funding if, as you said, that maybe they lose their funding. I mean, could the state withhold funding as a result of a lack of certification going forward? That's a really great question. And I, um, I read Professor Teachout's uh, testimony a little bit about that. I just wanna say, I'm not clear that removing funding because uh, a religious institution has a First Amendment right to discriminate is not a violation of the First Amendment. And so I, I think that's a really, that's a tough space. That's where the, uh, those recent cases that were discussed uh, comes in is like, can you then say, well, if you were gonna take public fundings, you have to then not discriminate and religious institutions are say, we have the right to discriminate. That's our first amendment right. And so you can't, re if we have a first amendment right, you can't then remove funding from us because then you're discriminating against us based on religion. And so. So, so religious, so the religious organization has the right to discriminate against very vulnerable populations based on something in their structure and belief. Anyway, uh, we won't go there. I don't even think it has to do, remember these cases were about disability and these cases were about breast cancer and age. So we're not even talking about religious institutions that, were, that could re rely on some kind of tenant that says it's against our our philosophy and our, our religious tenets. I mean, it's age and disability and they have the first amendment right to sort of do that. It, the, the key piece in those cases was that they have a first amendment right to choose their ministers. So, which I, I think, um, you know, that uh, is it, the, the question that again really comes down to who is a minister, and the most recent case uh, was was a significant sort of expansion from what had previously been covered in court cases. Um, but it it also you know it's basically saying if you're a religious school and you have someone who provides some form of religious activity. Um, then they are very likely covered by that ministerial uh, exception there. And that allows the, the religious institution to choose, choose whether to keep them on as a minister or not, because they have the right to choose their own ministers, the state. What the court is saying is the state can't interfere in that right. So. And of course, the US Supreme Court didn't set out the factors. They, they're just interpreting it case by case. And so that's why when Damien said that it's possible that a custodian could still not be a minister. And I said, I don't, who knows? <laughs> it's possible that a, a custodian whose job is primarily secular in nature is present for prayers and then is considered to play an important role in that. Yeah. Damien, so, did you have I, some I just wanted to say, I have to leave for my next hearing, so. Yeah. No, um, thank you, thank you, appreciate this. Yeah. Uh, other questions for Ms. Yang? Senator Perchlick. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Yang. Um, you answered most of my questions, I think, with your responses to Senator Lyon's questions, but, and I think we should keep the language in and kind of see what the courts do but I thought it was interesting your point about if we add something about how we determine if schools are in compliance. I mean, I guess it would be if they're found in violation of one of the anti-discrimination laws, then they would be not in compliance. And, and if that's sufficient, 
or if you feel like we should, and, and if you're willing to suggest language that we should add about that, how we determine if they're in compliance or not. Yeah, I, I, I think the question is who is make who would be making that determination as to whether someone is in compliance with discrimination. Obviously, at the local level, they would be looking to see if the certification is 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 accurate, but. Do you want an agency like the Human Rights Commission, whose job is to make kind of that decision, but we aren't a court mm -hmm. and we're not, we don't offer an administrative hearing or are people not in compliance only once a court in Vermont or a federal court has determined that they have violated the anti-discrimination laws? So I mentioned earlier that HUD would look to just us. HUD is not looking for a court determination that someone has violated the anti-discrimination laws. HUD relies on agencies like the Human Rights Commission to make kind of that preliminary uh, decision. The value of using an entity like the Human Rights Commission to determine whether discrimination has occurred is that it captures a lot more cases because many cases come through the HRC that doesn't actually get litigated. And so that might be valuable. Um, and because so many people are without resource, financial resources, the chances that they are going to file a case in court is less likely. And so I certainly think that that could be helpful. I will tell you that if um, we had a case involving a religious institution firing um, a teacher that Although actually I should say that that case would most likely go to the civil rights unit at the attorney general's office because we oversee uh, state government employees and there's a good chance that that's the kind of case that they would receive. If I were to see something like that, I probably wouldn't even accept it for an investigation because the US Supreme Court has already determined that there's no recourse in, in such a case. But absent that kind of example, I certainly think that uh, using entities like HUD, EEOC, or the Human Rights Commission to determine compliance is important because you're going to capture a lot more cases. If, if it pleases the chair, would you be willing to give us some language on that or examples from what HUD does or something like that? Sure. I, I could certainly do a little bit of that research. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you for suggesting it, Senator Perchlick, and thanks for accepting the offer, uh, Ms. Yang. I wonder also if you and perhaps in working with our ledge council might have some language around, um, you know, the compliance piece, yes, and then what's the enforcement piece look like? In other words, what happens when uh, things aren't compliant? What is that, you know, what then? Yeah. Can, I, can I interject there? So remember that this is in the context of um, only providing public funds. So this is an, out, an outright um, requirement to right. comply with these laws. So the consequence of non-compliance, I would guess, would be to, to have, make the school re refund, pay back the public funds they received uh, during the period that they were out of compliance. Because there's no, it's not like a criminal or civil right, action right, here. Right. Just, yeah. No, I think that's a good point, and maybe that that's that's then what we should just have drafted up and, and put in there. Yeah, I think that's because I do. Uh, think, sorry, go ahead, Ms. Yang. No, you please. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, please interrupt. I'm not interrupting. Uh, you're, you're helping the us. The problem that you might run into is yeah. you have a school, you have some independent schools in Vermont who are primarily funded, almost ninety percent by public funds. And if you find that they cannot certify, what are you shutting down that school? Are you removing all public funds or only the public funds as it relates to that particular student who was discriminated against? The way the bill is written, it would take the, you can't receive public funds unless you make the certification. Right. So to your point, they'd be losing all their public funding if they can't certify. So then they're going to go bankrupt and mm -hmm. it, there's, which maybe we don't care about, except all of those kids that live there don't have another school to necessarily go to. It, it might be important that 
the way I read it now is that it says you have to certify, but as far as the discrimination, it just says that you're in compliance with all federal and state discrimination laws, which is maybe a distinction that has no meaning, but that's the way it's worded now. When well, yeah. you're certifying one thing and then you're just in compliance with the discrimination laws. So I figure that's why some language on how to figure out if they're in compliance or not is important. Yeah, no, I, I think if if compliance isn't connect truly connected to certification, the certification is meaningless. Right. Well, the certification is about the religious instruction, not about the discrimination. Oh no, it is right. Am I am I reading it's, the right draft? Certification is connected. Maybe I'm not the, reading the right draft. Yeah, it's both. It's, it's both. both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, this is, this is very helpful. Incredible. I appreciate the dialogue. So if we could leave it for at least today that you will work with uh, Mr. Demaray to, to get us some different language, um, some new language, and then we'll look at that language uh, next week. I do think, uh, unless there's an objection from the committee, I, I would be surprised if when we do pass something out, I do think it makes sense for Senate Judiciary to see it. Um, and for them also to have an opportunity for new senators, you know, one of the things that can be very helpful when you get something that can be complicated uh, to have another committee see it. You also, if they're endorsing it, you 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 know you've got you know close to those fifteen votes, if you will. Uh, first of all, it gives people comfort that you know another committee of jurisdiction, uh, in this case, the judiciary has seen it. But then you add. You know, perhaps if we get, you know, if we were to get our six, we get judiciaries five, you know, we're, we're getting close to that 15 or 16 by the time we get to the floor. So, um, you know, there's there's some strategy there and as well as some, some comfort around another, another group of eyes. So thank you both for talking to us about this. Uh, I think right now, Mr. Hall, we will hold off on you, but we will likely have you back because this is not the end of this conversation. Um, and committee, if you don't mind, a uh, 10 minute break and then we will return to, uh, so that'll be 10 minutes to uh, three and then we'll return to our conversation with uh, joint fiscal or start our conversation with joint fiscal. Thank you, Bor. Thank you all, good luck. Bor, Thank Bor, you, thanks Dave. a billion, yeah. really appreciate yeah. it.